What's going on? My day-to-day -day people. Got my people with me, huh? Got my people with me. All right. Let's keep on this journey of the Kingdom Derby. All right. So this is part three. As first and foremost, all praises to the Most High through His Son, our Lord, King of Kings, Jesus Christ. All praises, man. All praises goes to the Father, okay? All praises. Now, there's one thing, particular thing that, that I do that I like to share. I'm not pretty sure if I've done this before or said this before. Like, um, anytime you help somebody or, you know, do the things that you need to do inside of the body of Christ, that, that is needed, okay? What's not needed is just to sit back and watch the world go by and not do anything. Let's remember what the two angels said to them after our Messiah, Jesus, had ascended. He said, why are you standing here? The same way he left is the same way he's going to return. So basically, get to moving. Don't y'all got some stuff y'all need to do? So, that's how we are to be, all right? There's no need to just sit here and watch the world go by. Sit here and just watch for the Messiah to go by without actually helping, all right? We have to help. We have to put our foot forward and go off faith. And there are a lot of people out there that, that needs help a lot, a lot. So, when you help somebody and then they say, thank you, you know, they, of course, somebody's going to show gratitude when, when helped, when, when their help is delivered. When they say thank you, one thing I do, I say, do not thank me because I'm just a man, all right? I'm just a man and I'm following Christ. Give praises to the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. So, here we are. We're going to start in uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 21. We're going to go 1 through 8. 21. Then there was a famine in the days of David, three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. Okay, so now we see a famine has occurred because of what Saul had did by basically killing the Gibeonites. Okay, now let's keep reading. Two, and the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore, David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that you may be blessed the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say that I will do, or I'm sorry, that will I do for you? So he's sitting here like, Okay, what do you want me to do? They're saying, we don't want no silver, we don't, we don't want no gold, we don't want anything that has to do with salt. All right, so, five. And they answered the king, the man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed for remaining in any of the coast of Israel. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose, and the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David, Jonathan, the son of Saul. Now, they're wanting their sons. They're like, all right, just give, give me his sons. So King David said, okay. But he spared one because of this particular oath. And we're going to go see that. That is in, still in Samuel. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 10. All right, so it says, we're going to start at 9. Then the king called Zeba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. 10. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till 
the land for him. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Meshebasheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Zeba had 15 sons and 20 servants. All right, so. Yeah, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Then said Zeba unto the king, according to all that my lord, the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Meshebasheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Zeba were servants unto Meshebosheth. So Meshebosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. All right, so he had a problem. He was lame. All right. So the oath that was made was to protect this kid, protect Meshebosheth, that he'll always eat at the king's table. Okay. So with that being said, when they had asked, uh, the Gibeonites had asked for the sons of Saul, basically as a revenge payment, he had to spare this one particular son because of an oath that took place in uh, this passage right here. Now, let's go to uh, let's go to Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 47. Chapter 47, verse 13. That's Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore. So that the land of Egypt... And all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. So here we go with famine. Remember what famine is. All right. 14. And Joseph gathered up the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph bought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. You see that? The money failed. The money failed in, during the time of a, a crisis with this famine. Now, I want you to open your mind and think about what has happened over the duration of the last 400 and something days. We kept hearing things about money playing around, you know, the change, change shortage, food shortage, like these things, I'm not sitting here saying that what's going on is identical, but history repeats itself, and history repeats itself, one particular reason why is because of greed and the continuance of sin, greed and the continuance of sin is why these things keep coming around and coming around and coming around. Now, like I said, the money failed. The money failed. So what does that tell everybody when we see right now in this passage how there's a famine, but money failed? All right, so 16. And Joseph said, give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they bought, or I'm sorry, and they brought their cattle into Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So now we see a bartering system going on. Money fails, so it's time to barter. You know, barter's basically trading. All right. Uh, 18. When the year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord. How that our money is spent, my Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. They ain't got nothing else to trade. They ain't, they've already went through it all. 19. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. 21. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned 
them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is the seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt until this day that Pharaoh should have a fifth part except the land of the priest only, which became not Pharaoh's. Now, let's pay attention to what's going on here, right? So, it's like a deal. Their, their, their land got bought. They gave them seed. They can plant, but they have to give some to Pharaoh, keep some for themselves. That's part of the deal. Now, with what's going on when they're calling my Lord, they're not saying the Lord as in um, the Most High. What they're saying is my Lord as in the person that's above them. If we remember when Sarah would call Abraham, my Lord. So it's just a gesture of somebody who's over them and they respect and they acknowledge who they are. All right. Just a little fun fact. So 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and seven years. All right, so this is some good stuff right here. From here, we are going to go. I'll see if I can find a little, little more to, to dig into. But from here, let's go to Psalm 37. We're going to go to Psalm 37, verse 11. So that's Psalm 37. Chapter, yeah, chapter 37. We're going to start at 11. We're going to end at 19. So 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, the meek shall inherit the earth. We've heard this before, right? But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Let's read this one one more time at 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Man. So 15. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. And this is so true. What little that you have is better than any riches of the wicked. Run that back. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. All right. So our riches are not money. It's not jewelry. It's not cars. It's not houses. The riches the wisdom, it's knowledge, faith, right? You store your treasures up in heaven, not other things of the earth, all right? You set your affection on the things of above and not on the things of the earth. That's Colossians 3, 2. All right, so make sure I don't skip this. 17, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. 18, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. 19. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. We've seen that with Joseph. All right? So, 20. I know I said 19, but we're going to go one more. 20. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. All right. From here, let's go to Psalm 107. 
know, this is just a good insight of if you're righteous, if you're found righteous during a famine, you're gonna you're gonna be okay. All right. Let's look at what the Most High did with the raven, right? When he fed Elijah. Okay. We're not going to starve. That's why you have to practice fasting. Practice fasting and, and prayer and all of these things that we need to do. So when things happen like this, we automatically put our book bag of faith on and we're like, okay, let's go. Just like Abraham. Abraham left his whole family, went to a land that he didn't know because of faith. All right? So you just throw that faith on, let's go. Let's go. This world's looking crazy, I'm going to throw this faith on, let's go. They're talking about food shortage, I'm going to throw this faith on, let's go. Okay? They're talking about persecution over there, I'm going to throw this faith on, let's go. All right? They're talking about coming against this word, coming against the churches, coming against anything that has anything to do with the Most High and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the correct doctrines out there. I'm going to throw this faith on, let's go. Let's go. There's nothing the enemy can throw at me. That's going to derail me for what I believe in, for what I stand on. So anything that I see that does not look right, that may seem scary to my flesh, guess what? You put your flesh off, therefore you're not going to be scared because you have faith. So I'm going to put this faith on. Let's go. All praises. Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We're going to look at 33 and 34. Psalm 107, we're going to look at 33 and 34. It says, He turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. So we got to remember, our Father controls these skies. It's up to Him when it rains. So when a famine happens, He dries up the, he dries up the rain. He dries up the water. Right? So... 33, he turned up rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. 34, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turned up the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he make up the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. He blesses them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffers not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are menished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. You see that? These things happen to, if you are, well, ancient people, Israelites that we see, the remnant that seen these things that did not taste death, they seen the famine and actually had to, the go and be like, oh man, this happened because we are going against the Lord. So these things happen for repentance, okay? Repentance. Now, we see the famine of food. There's also going to be a famine of the word. It's going to be a famine of the word. Now let's go to Amos. It's going to be Amos. Chapter 8, uh, verse 11. If I can get here. It's Amos, chapter 8, verse 11. Now, this big exhortation was heavily on, on famine. You know, you got the sword. You got famine. Well, you got the sword. You got the disease. You got death. I mean... The four punishments of, of God are, you got to think, our Father, our ways are not his ways, our thoughts are not his thoughts. The last thing he wants to do, he even tells you in scripture, he says, I have no pleasure in destroying the wicked, right? He wants all to come to repentance. So it's not like he's doing these things to, to destroy people. I mean, he, he don't want to do it. But at the same time, he can't allow us to keep sinning repeatedly and, and doing these crazy things because what happens is sin starts one place and then it grows like a wildfire. And we see what happens whenever a fire started and it gets like crazy and they have to send 
firefighters and so many people out there and sometimes helicopters with water to, to stop it. That's, that's how sin is. So he's not going to sit there and condone the sin just to start in one pocket because he knows the sin is going to flourish. It's going to go like wildfire. So these four punishments comes in and it stops it, right? It stops it. It stops the people that's doing it so that when they see, okay, if they survived that, oh, we went against the Lord. All right, we got to go back. We got to retrace our steps and go back. All right? So Amos chapter 8, verse 11. It says, Behold, the days come saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north, even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. So he said, There's going to be a day where the word of the Lord is not going to be found, and people's going to be going all over the place to try to find it. All right? Now we can look at something that's parallel to it with the foolish virgins, the ten foolish virgins. Oh, I'm sorry. The. Ten virgins, you had five foolish, you had five that were wise. So once they seen what oil they were talking about, they tried to run and the door was shut. All right? Much love. Peace.